Good morning, everybody, and welcome to those of you that have joined. We've just opened the live link. We are just going to wait for a few minutes to allow everybody to join us before we start. We apologize for the late start. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Five Stone Buildings webinar program. We've just opened the live link, so we're just waiting for a few minutes to allow everybody to join us before we start. Whilst we are waiting for everybody to join us, I shall just remind you of the house rules. So just to remind you that this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions throughout this webinar, please put your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and our speaker will try to come to your questions at the end if we have time. If you do not wish to be identified when asking your question, then please tick the anonymous box so our speaker will not identify you in their response. And just to remind you that we now have a separate section on the Five Stone Buildings website where you can find a copy of this recording um, and any previous webinars that have now taken place. I will now hand you over to today's speaker, which is Charlotte Edge. Hey everybody, again, I'm sorry we're starting a bit late. Um, I, as I'm sure you've realised, I'm going to be talking about mediation in the Court of Protection. And Joe's just mentioned the past webinars on the website. Um, we did a really comprehensive seminar back in October of the, last year on mediation, you know, the whole process of mediation from start to finish. I think we called it mediation in 2021. Where are we now? It's on the website. Um, if you haven't listened to that, I think it's also worth going back to that on general mediation issues. Uh, there was lots on online mediations, lots on mediation preparation, all of which is obviously relevant to the Court of Protection as well. Um, today, what I'm going to do is just limit this to sort of specifically Court of Protection issues. Um, I think we're going to be about half an hour, so hopefully uh, we will all still have some time for lunch despite starting a bit late. Um, my specialism in the court of protection field, as I think a lot of you know, is very much on the property and affairs side. Uh, I will touch on health and welfare where I think I can say something uh, useful. Um, but really, you know, for me, this is more property and affairs focused. Um, I thought the perhaps the best place to start is by looking at where we are with support for mediation in the court of protection and the a plethora of pilot programs that have happened um, and then go on to have a look at the sort of cases that you know we we can and maybe should be mediating um, and then some practical aspects of mediation specifically on court of protection issues. Um, there have been so, so many pilot schemes uh, and mediation reports and uh, roundtables on mediation in the Court of Protection now that someone actually mentioned a pilot programme to me the other day and I was asking questions about it thinking how interesting it sounded before realising that it was one of the ones that I was actually a mediator for back in 2017. So there's been a lot of talk about this issue and I, I sometimes think perhaps we're slightly in danger of over-egging the pudding. Um, Way back in 2014, there was a House of Lords select committee into the Mental Capacity Act in general and how it was working. Uh, that select committee recommended that there should be more mediation in the Court of Protection. I think they actually recommended that compulsory mediation should be considered, which is you know, probably, I think, perhaps taking it a little too far. Uh, but they certainly recommended that mediation should be used a lot more. Um, the 2017 pilot scheme that I've just mentioned was run by the OPG. Um, that scheme, I think, was uh, certainly I felt slightly hamstrung by the fact that it was a telephone only mediation scheme. It was pre issue. Um, the formula was a slightly clunky back and forth telephone arrangement. It was very much before the, uh, the the fluidity that the pandemic has brought to virtual mediations. I don't actually know if I ever formally reported conclusions. Uh, there was a, a quite interesting survey and report done in June 2019 by a solicitor called Charlotte May with, I think, some judicial encouragement, uh, 
which looked a lot at how much mediation was going on then in the Court of Protection. And most recently, of course, there's been the quite extended mediation pilot scheme, which I think a lot of us would have come across, which involved a panel of mediators uh, on fixed rates set at the legal aid level. Um, I think that involved all aspects, did involve all aspects of Court of Protection work, uh, but it was a condition of the scheme that it had to be post issue. That scheme has concluded now, um, but hasn't yet reported its conclusions. But given all of that, I think it's actually, you know, both amusing and slightly sad that one of the points which Charlotte May's report in June 2019 flagged up is that the main reason that practitioners are giving as to why they aren't doing more mediations in the court of protection is a lack of awareness. Um, you know, there's clearly a bit of disconnect here where we have all these reports coming out of our ears and, and nobody knows that court of protection mediation is, is, is available to them. Personally, I almost wonder whether the number of pilots is putting people off in the sense that um, it gives the impression that court of protection mediation is, is, is something that is new or perhaps is untested um, or that you, know, you have to be on a pilot scheme to do it. None of those things are, I think, necessarily true. I, um, I talked uh, recently at a conference on the um, more on the contentious probate side where we had a slightly silly uh, debate about whether or not mediation was a good thing um, and I think you know really nobody on the uh, contentious probate litigation side was putting forward any argument that, that mediation is not an extremely useful and relevant tool in the chancery division but it was it was also very obvious to me that when we started talking about court of protection issues, people were much more nervous. We did some case studies, and you know, all of the um, uh, all of the more chancery division type litigation, we we ran through case studies and said what would be the, the the benefits and the 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 risks or the, the the sticking points of mediation in these various case studies. When we looked at them on the chancery side, um, people were prepared to overcome some quite big hurdles and still wanted to mediate what I thought were, were uh, cases that had some quite serious sticking points to mediation. And then on the court of protection side, we came up with a situation that was you know, loosely and anonymous, anonymously based on a, a, a real life situation that had actually been successfully mediated. And all of the practitioners in our audience got terribly nervous and worried and uh, thought that, that that was a mediation that they, they wouldn't want to pursue. So I think it is important to say that mediation in the court of protection is, you know, to use a colloquialism, a, a thing. Mediation is going on in the court of protection. Um, yes, it's been happening under the pilot scheme. It's also been happening outside of the pilot scheme. It's very difficult to get statistics on how much mediation is going on. Uh, the Charlotte May report, again, she looked through all the online cases on Bailey, uh, the court of protection cases on Bailey, and found that 5% of those mentioned mediation. Now, if you take into account the fact that the vast majority of cases that settle at mediation aren't going to produce a written judgment because you'll have some sort of consent order, um, assuming that you know, you've issued and, and gone to proceedings at all, uh, some cases are presumably being settled before issue. Um, you know, if there's a failed mediation, that's not always going to be mentioned in the judgment. If you put all of those things together with that 5% figure in the reported cases, I think it actually starts to look as if quite a lot of mediations are going on. Um, the official solicitor, I know certainly on the property and affairs team, is open to mediation in cases where it would be helpful um, and where there's a decent prospect it will lead to settlement. Um, I don't do a huge amount with local authorities myself, but my understanding is that they are quite keen on mediation, particularly where there are issues like residents involved. Um, all of that, I think, is a, a good thing. Um, in terms of support in the Court of Protection rules and the Code of Practice, uh, there's not a huge amount of mention of mediation, but the rules lists ADR as 
part of the court's active case management powers without really elaborating on how you might like to pursue ADR, but it, it's there at um, paragraph 113, I think, of the Court of Protection Rules. Um, the Code of Practice, the Court of Protection Code of Practice, actually says quite a lot about mediation and why you might want to do it. That's at paragraph 157 onwards, and I think is worth looking and have come back to some of that in a minute. So, yeah. Mediation, I think, it is happening and it is probably becoming more accepted in the Court of Protection. My uh, understanding, I think, is that as with everything that is new, people are more wary to start with. And the more mediations that uh, are, are going through successfully, the more practitioners are starting to think, well, maybe this is something that can add value. Um, it, I think, is, is a successful and positive thing in the Court of Protection. Again, looking back at the Charlotte May report, she pulled out some statistics as she uh, surveyed a number of practitioners in the area. She got them sending case studies about mediations that they had done in the Court of Protection. She asked them for their views on um, you know, how mediation works, the, the mediations that they thought had been successful, what the benefits of it were. Um, and, and the statistics that, sh that that produced were that 77% of the court protection mediations that were uh, reported to her had successfully settled on the day or shortly afterwards. I, you know, I think that's actually a pretty good statistic and I, 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 it's comparable to, say, mediations in the Chancery Division. Um, so we know it's happening, we know it works. I wanted to have a look at the cases where I think it is particularly helpful and relevant. I'm going to go back, I said I'd, I'd come back to the Court of Protection Code of Practice. Uh, this is paragraph 15.7. I think this is a really nice description of mediation in general and how and why it can work. Uh, so the Code of Practice says, a mediator helps people to come to an agreement that is acceptable to all parties you hope, that uh, mediation can help solve a problem at an early stage. It is, um, it offers a wider range of solutions than the court can. That's one of the things that I always think is a really key benefit of mediation across all fields. Uh, it may be less stressful for all parties. Um, and I'm going to come on again to, to P and how that interrelates with P's involvement in proceedings. Uh, it can be more cost effective and quicker. People who come to an agreement through mediation are more likely to keep to it because they have taken part in decision making. And again, that last point, I think, is something that can be really relevant to the protection proceedings. If you are deciding whether to mediate in any given case, and obviously all cases are different in terms of what is going to be helpful to you, um, that I think is a decision that you are going to want to be taking in accordance with the overriding objective at the beginning of the Court of Protection Rules. Um, so the, the, the Court of Protection uh, overriding objective, you know, we have the standard wording of enabling the court to deal with a case justly at a proportionate cost, having regard to the principles of the Mental Capacity Act. Um, and then the, the rules list some uh, specific issues that, that need to be taken into account. Um, and I'm just going to pull some of those out. So at 11A, we have making sure that the case is dealt with expeditiously and fairly. Um, at at 11B, we have ensuring that P's interests and position are properly considered. I'll come back to that as to how you can get P involved. Um, dealing with the case in ways which are proportionate to the nature, importance and complexity of the issues. Um, D now, ensuring that the parties are on an equal footing, saving expense, something I always flag up as a benefit of mediation, uh, and allocating an appropriate share of the court's resources. All of those, I think, are factors that can point to mediation being incredibly helpful. In terms of the specific type of cases that you get in the Court of Protection, um, uh, one of the things that I think can really be one of the, the types of cases that I think mediation can be particularly suitable for are those cases that you get where there is a fractured relationship between the parties um, 
and I think also possibly cases where there isn't yet a completely fractured relationship, but there is jolly well going to be one if you have to have a, a protracted period of litigation and then a contested final disposal hearing. Um, but, but those cases where you have a lot of people surrounding P, all of whom have differing and sometimes conflicting views as to what is in P's best interest. And I think, you know, personally, I think it is rarely the case in the Court of Protection that people don't want what is best for P. Uh, usually they have different views on what the best thing is, but, it, you know, it's, it, regardless of what one's own clients say, it's, it's not often that someone is coming to the Court of Protection, you know, intent on pursuing their own interests at the expense of P's. And I think, one of the things that mediation is really good at is allowing people who have differing views and, and quite strongly held differing views to, to air those views and feel like they've been heard and acknowledged and taken into account as part of the decision making process. Um, that is something I think that mediation can be really good at. I personally, as a mediator, I think I spend a lot of time as a, a shock absorber. I, I spend a lot of time with people, um, you know, almost downloading to me all of the things that they want to say. And then uh, my job, I think, is, is often to, to work out which of those things it is most helpful to then share with the other parties at the mediation and, and you know, what, what are the aspects of that that can be taken forward in a constructive manner. But I think it very often makes a huge difference to family members if they can come to mediation and they can really feel that the points that they are making have been heard, that someone has acknowledged them, that they're not just shouting into the void. And I think it's surprising how often people, once they've had that opportunity to air all of their views, um, will really calm down about an issue and then feel like they can listen to what is being said back to them. Um, uh, and then you, that's when you can start moving, I think, perhaps more creatively towards a solution. So, you know, anything in the Court of Protection that affects individuals who have to work together in the future, I think, is a situation where mediation should be really seriously considered. And obviously, that's going to be relevant to deputy ships and attorney ships, where you're going to need a working relationship going forward, either within the family and between family members or with the family and third parties. There was a decision in uh, 2021 RECB where the local authority agreed to the appointment of P's sister as deputy for health and welfare, as well as for property and affairs. Um, that had previously been a contested issue on the basis that, let me quote here, uh, in part, because of the mediation, um, a level of trust, which has previously been absent, was built up between the local authority and the sister. And I think that's a really nice example of a situation where a, a successful mediation can actually take the parties forward to somewhere where litigation just would not have allowed them to go. Um, cases that I think also are um, cases where I think mediation can also be particularly helpful that come up a lot in the court of protection, perhaps more than in sort of the more chancery mediations that I also deal with, are those situations where there is perhaps an imbalance between the parties in terms of uh, the amount of legal representation that they have, the amount of power that they feel they have over um, decision making for P. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon, I think, to come across situations where some family members feel really left out of the decision making process. Um, and I think the more that you can get everybody involved in a mediation situation, the more everybody feels again, you know, that their voice has been heard and that they've had the opportunity to participate. Um, and this, I think, brings me back to the paragraph that I just read out from the Court of Protection Code of Practice that people who have had input into a decision are much more likely to stick to it. Um, and in my experience, are, are gonna feel much happier about it than a decision that's just been imposed on them top down by the court. So if you're anything where you're trying to get family members to, to, to buy in, to move forward, to have a working relationship, all of which is obviously gonna be in the best interest of P, then I think 
that is the sort of situation where mediation should really be being considered quite seriously. Um, I, I do know, as I said, I don't do a lot on the health and welfare side, but I do know that along with um, sort of medical issues, the, the things that are mediated a lot on that side are, are, as you would expect, really residents, care agreements, visitation, those sorts of questions, where again, it's about people working together and sort of coming up with a, a plan for, for P for the future. I want to make special mention of statutory wills cases here, because I think there is a lot about a, a, a typical statutory wills um, disagreement that is just ideal for the mediation arena. Um, you tend to have some very clearly defined interested parties, so it's quite easy to work out who needs to be there. Um, you have a specific issue that needs to be resolved and you have the potential for reaching a very clear agreement on that decision. Um, there is potentially a significant cost saving there for P. That, I, you know, I think, um, it, you know, perhaps we have all had moments litigating statutory wills cases where it can sometimes feel a little bit distasteful to be spending a lot of what is likely to be P's money during P's life on an issue that is only going to affect um, P's estate after he or, her is, he or she is dead. Um, you know, I, I certainly had that conversation with practitioners in the past where we've been involved in litigation and felt that if there were a way to reduce those costs, that would certainly be a good thing. Um, you know, if you're looking back at all of those, you know, those sort of really older cases about what is in P's best interest in relation to wills and, you know, there's the more historic discussions about uh, P being thought well of, being remembered well. Um, you know, I know those are the, sort of perhaps the older cases, but I think, you know, interesting to consider in terms of getting everybody involved and having a discussion amongst the family about what is in P's best interest. Um, you know, it, you, uh, you, the more that you are involved as a member of Peace Family in that discussion and you feel like your views have been taken into account, hopefully the more that allows the family members to, to retain that relationship with P and feel like things have, have gone ahead on, a, on an, a fair footing so that you're not then doing something that I also find is quite difficult, which is, is um, stirring the pot of P's relations with his or her immediate family. Um, again, on an issue that only affects Peter State after his or her death. Um, just my l last thing on my, my uh, public service announcement about, about um, mediating statutory wills claims is the time saving of mediation. Um, you know, it, statutory wills cases don't always, but do quite often come up. I think where you're, you know, everyone suddenly had a panic because you've realised you're approaching the end of P's life. I have certainly, in my experience as a litigator, had the situation where P died in, you know, tragically between the making of a holding will and um, judgment being handed down on the final hearing. And uh, in terms of mediation, you certainly have the opportunity to speed up the court process. I know people always say that, people quite often say to me, you know, well, we're arranging a mediation takes time I think that's true but I also think you know if you can scramble on a Friday afternoon to get a um a, a holding will application before a duty judge which is certainly a thing that we can all do then I think you can probably also scramble to have a mediation you know Tuesday of next week if everybody thinks that it would be helpful if you have sufficient buy-in I think you can always get a mediation up and up and running at short notice it's not like there's a shortage of mediators um so I think those are all the situations where I think mediation can be really, really helpful. I think uh, I should probably touch on the cases where I think it's generally agreed that mediation would be unsuitable. Um, the big one that I think I need to flag up is that you really, really cannot mediate at all the question of whether or not P has capacity to make whatever decision is the subject of the proceedings or to participate in the proceedings themselves. If there is any doubt about P's capacity, that needs to be determined by the court and you need a declaration to that effect. Um, obviously, if P does have capacity, then 
the court doesn't have jurisdiction in the first place. And so you do need that to be clear. I think that's one of the benefits actually of, of holding mediations only after issue is that you by then to have gone through that process of establishing capacity. Um, personally, I think it is very difficult to see how you could mediate where there are allegations of abuse and certainly sort of safeguarding issues and personal abuse, I think almost impossible. Financial abuse, unless it's, you know, very minimal and you could probably, you know, most people would call it irregularities. Um, I think that's going to be difficult. I think if you, you know, you have a deputy or an attorney where there are allegations of financial abuse, that is going to want, that's going to need to be properly aired and determined by a judicial authority. I think if you have a family member where there are allegations of financial abuse, that is something that you would want to be very careful about mediating, partly because of the risk of um, the abusive party having too much sway in the mediation and putting other family members under pressure. And also because I think if there are allegations like that floating around, you know, in mediation in general, actually, it, A, it can un, uh, derail the mediation quite substantially, but, but B, that is a thing that I think many people would say they are entitled to have properly determined by the court, not just for peace sake, but also for the sake of the person against whom the allegations are being made. That in mediation in all fields, that is a situation where people very often say that they want to have the court determining the issue because um, that way their name, as they say, can be cleared. So I, I am certainly very nervous about, issue, uh, about mediating issues where there are any allegations of abuse. Um, one of the things that I think can also be quite difficult in the court of protection is disputes where there isn't an issue that can be resolved into a clear agreement. This was something that really I reported back on the, um, the OPG's telephone mediation scheme way back in 2017, where that was the, the scheme was pre-issue. And not everybody who came to the mediation had completely fleshed out what their concerns were, what the disagreement was. And it then became quite difficult in some cases really to work out what the terms of the agreement were. And I think it's important if you're gonna have a mediation which is useful, that you A, know exactly what the parameters of the debate are, B, um, know how you're going to record that in an agreement so that everybody is clear about what has actually been agreed and C, that everybody is clear on what happens if the agreement is not met. So if you're coming out of, an, a, of a mediation and there is an agreement you know, that everyone is going to use their best endeavors to, um, you know, to, to not interfere with each other's visiting P or that you know, their best endeavors to seek the input of family members on, on the questions of the sale of property or something, something like that can be quite difficult to work going forwards because not everybody knows exactly what they have to be doing and so if someone doesn't do what they need to be doing you know, where do you go so I, I, that's one of the things that I think is is a potentially a problem in the court of protection I think perhaps more a problem in the court of protection than in other areas of litigation that I see that you you do need to be able to say exactly what your issue is how you're determining it and where you're going after the mediation agreement has been concluded um now I I was going to come on to some practical issues and when to have a mediation that actually follows on quite nicely from what I was saying about making sure that you have got a clearly defined issue. Uh, as in all areas, you can have a mediation at any time that you want to, you can have an issue, uh, you can have a mediation before anyone's issued. The most recent, the sort of long running pilot schemes, as I say, only accepted cases after issue. Um, I think really this is a question that you need to look at each individual case uh, and try and decide whether you need to wait for more evidence, whether you need to wait for more information, or you know, to look at it another way, is it better to get on with it earlier before the parties get completely entrenched and hostile and it's become actually too difficult to get them together. So I think that is one of those questions that is really just a judgment call in terms of the specific facts of the case and the specific um, uh, uh, personalities of the individuals involved. Um, I sometimes get asked about costs in court protection mediation cases. Um, 
obviously on the health and welfare side, well, can you say in, in, in my view, and I think most people's view, a mediation is a step in the litigation. And so the usual rules for quarter protection costs would apply. So you're looking at either you know, health and welfare, everyone's bearing their own costs or property and affairs. The usual rule is that the costs will be paid out of P's funds. I mean, personally, I don't think there's really any other tenable position than that mediation is a step in the proceedings and so is subject to the normal cost rules. Um, however, if you are feeling particularly nervous about it or you have a client who is feeling particularly nervous about whether the mediation costs are going to be covered by the general rule uh, because all of the pilot programs have, have you know, put you off, um, I don't think there's any reason not to ask the court to direct a mediation or, or you know to direct attempts towards a mediation as part of the court's case management powers and that would certainly I think give you quite a high level of protection there. Um, one thing that does come up I know is that there are quite often um, hard costs what I would call hard costs involved in a mediation so you know you're going to have to hire the room or a suite of rooms perhaps uh, I know a lot of mediators expect to be paid in advance or pretty soon after the mediation, and that can be difficult on the property and affairs side, where if everyone is behaving in a generally reasonable manner, uh, and so assuming that the final costs are going to come out of P's funds, um, it can leave you with a problem as to who is actually going to put their hand in their pocket and pay for those costs up front. Uh, I mean, if there is really no way around that, you know, so for example, on the rooms, can you use the rooms in uh, the, the building of one of the solicitors who's available, even if everybody is a little bit less comfortable? Um, uh, you know, can you ask the mediator nicely for deferred, defer, deferred uh, payment, you know, because it's a court of protection matter? And I think, you know, certainly my own, I have a standard mediation agreement, but it's not written in blood. It, you know, there is flexibility there for most people, I think. Um, you know, if you can't resolve that hard cost issue in some way by just, you know, seeing what you can ask for, um, I think there's no reason not to ask the court to authorise a payment of those, those funds out of piece of state. So if there's a deputy attorney, you just authorise deputy attorney to make payment of the funds. Um, but I think do ask the court if you're going to do that because um, bear in mind that you know the standard terms of a property and affairs deputyship, deputyship are not going to encompass the pursuit of litigation. Um, and I, I think I, personally, if I were advising a deputy or, or an attorney, I, I would want some sort of comfort before actually making an upfront payment out of peace funds. I, um, as I say, I don't do a huge amount of work with local authorities, but just on the cost point, I do sometimes come across situations where the local authority has picked up the bill. Um, and actually, I when I was I went back and looked at Charlotte May's report before I did this seminar, and one of the really useful nuggets of information in that is that uh, of the cases that she surveyed, um, in 37% of those mediations, I suspect those are mostly on the health and welfare side, but on 37% of the mediations that she looked at, the local authority had picked up costs. So, you know, that to me says it is, uh, you know, clearly worth asking um, uh, and see what you can do. I did a long time ago, I did a mediation where I was not the mediator, I was representing one of the parties concerned and the local authority did exactly that. They, they paid the costs of the mediation I mean, actually very generously um, and paid the cost of all sorts of bits of the mediation that to be honest weren't directly relevant to the local authorities involvement so you know if practically you are scratching your head um, you know don't ask don't get so I just mentioned that in case it's ever helpful so um, we hopefully agree we're going to have a mediation we're going to we've hopefully worked out how we're going to pay for it um, the next question I was thinking is who is coming um, and there's two aspects that I want to talk about here, uh, attendance by P and attendance by everybody else. Um, attendance by P is something that gets mentioned a lot in the literature on court of protection mediation, so, you know, all of these reports that I'm talking about, about why uh, mediation would be a, a good thing in the court of protection. I know there is concern that P is not always as involved in proceedings in the court of protection as he or she could be. 
Um, and so one of the things being put forward as a benefit of mediation is that P could be more involved in the process. Um, I think there are uh, a few things to say about that. Firstly, obviously, P is going to need to be represented, um, you know, either by litigation brand or uh, last resort by the official solicitor. Um, so that representative needs to be able to provide input at the mediation. Um, I think it does happen that, you know, POS is not able to attend in person. Maybe they will attend by telephone. I think that's always an option for anyone. Um, obviously, the more chance that P is given to set out his current wishes and feelings, the better from the perspective of making a sound best interest decision under the Mental Capacity Act. Um, and also, frankly, in terms of making the other parties in the litigation feel that this is a decision that will stick and that everybody can be comfortable with. You know, I, we as practitioners are all going to be looking at the section four criteria and working out what's a best decision, interest decision, and that's absolutely right. Um, I think parties attending the mediation as family members are also going to be concerned about whether you know, P's current wishes and feelings are in line with the decision that's being made. So the more that you can do to ascertain those and have those available to everybody at the mediation, I think the better from everybody's perspective. Um, it, I think in keeping with this aim of giving P more involvement in the process, it is worth considering whether P can actually physically attend the mediation with the appropriate support and whether there are adjustments that could reasonably be made that would facilitate attendance where it otherwise seems impossible. Um, and I did a mediation years ago, it, it was a 75 claim. it wasn't a good protection issue, but two of the parties were very elderly and essentially housebound. And so we did the mediation at their house. So we had um, a party in the dining room, which was quite nice because the dining table. Uh, we did a we had a party in the living room, which was very comfortable sitting on the sofa, slightly annoying, kneeling down to write on the coffee table. Um, at at uh, a later stage of the proceedings, we all ordered pizza and we all stood around and ate it in the kitchen and then collaboratively did the washing up. It was unorthodox, but it worked and it allowed the um, two parties to the proceedings who were quite essential party to the proceedings to, to participate in a way that really they would not have managed participation um, if we'd all been in a solicitor's office, you know, even a solicitor's office 20 minutes up the road, they just would not have been able to manage that and, and, and had the stamina to keep up with the day. Um, the, the, the obvious thing as well to mention here is remote mediations. Um, I, I mean, I am a, I'm a big fan increasingly of virtual mediations. I think they have their dangers. Um, we went into all of that quite a lot in the, um, the, the general mediation seminar that we did last October about the, the pros and cons of virtual mediations. I suspect that we all now have our own views on the pros and cons of virtual mediations. In the court of protection field, I think there are, it's just worth having a little extra note of caution where you're talking about P because um, if you're talking about P who is elderly, which we often are, then you're almost by definition talking about someone who is going to be less au fait with technology than if everybody attending is in their 40s. So that's one issue. Um, but also I think uh, online technology and, and talking to someone, you know, the way that I'm talking to you all now and you're all hopefully listening, although I can't see any of you, um, that is, um, that can be very confusing if you if you are already a person of limited capacity dealing with a lot of people on a screen where they're not physically in the room and people are talking and it's swapping back and forth I mean you can see how that is really going to be very difficult and is not going to allow P to to properly formulate and express wishes and feelings in a way that perhaps P could with more support in a one-on-one -on -one situation with uh, a trusted individual or a trained individual not over a sort of confusing flat screen. So I think that is um, a risk with virtual mediations. But you know, again, as, as I say, helpful to have the mediation, could you have the mediation in a, in a domestic setting in a less um, 
uh, formal setting than the solicitor's office. You know, maybe you do it in a virtual setting and, and, and rather than in the mediation that I did a while ago, everybody kneeling around the coffee table in the sitting room, um, perhaps people who aren't P attend remotely and you do it that way so that, that you're facilitating P's involvement as much as you possibly can in a sensitive way. Um, something that I find surprising, but I am aware of is, um, it is mediators who, uh, sorry, I'm trying, to, <laughs> I'm trying to say this without being rude. Uh, uh, something that I'm aware of is, is mediators who sort of put themselves forward as, as, as saying that in the court of protection, they will, they will attempt themselves to ascertain P's wishes and feelings and ensure that, that you know, the agreement is in line with those. I find that I find, slightly horrifying and I would say you know no that is not the job of a mediator you know we as mediators we are not judges we are not decision making authorities um we are not so no, I'm not trained but I think you know a lot of mediators are not we are not the appropriate person to be sitting down with P and ascertaining P's views I mean I certainly would say that my job as a mediator is when people are discussing a decision to say and how do we think P's views chime into this from a section four criteria Yes, absolutely my job. Uh, sitting down with P with a notepad on my lap and attempting myself to um, engage with P and ascertain P's wishes and feelings, fundamentally not my job. And so I would be very cautious of that if that is a thing that you come across. Um, my other warning about um, uh, sort of dealing with court of protection mediation questions is that there is always a tendency at mediation to try to wrap up as many issues as possible. And that I think is a massive benefit of mediation. So you can, um, you know, mediators always talk about the, the chattels, you know, because we see it so often because we're always there at 11 o'clock with someone still doing the wretched list of chattels. Um, the, um, the question of can, what else can we settle? comes up, I think, a lot in mediation. You know, you have the main issue and then you have other issues and then there are things that turn out during the course of the day to be important to the parties and you think, well, that's brilliant. Let's try and get everything into this agreement because that will make everybody happier and actually, you know, person A can give something to person B and person B can give something back to person A and we've reached a creative solution. Brilliant. That's one of the main benefits of mediation as opposed to proceedings in court where the court's jurisdiction is limited. But please be careful in the court of protection, I think this is important, that you are not in doing that, straying into areas where P actually has capacity to make the decision him or herself. And I think that is a risk. Uh, again, there's sort of a, a court of protection specific danger with mediations. Um, you know, A, you're going to need an order, to, uh, an order of the court to put this into effect, most likely, I'm gonna come onto that in a second, but B, you know, obviously you just need to be careful that you're not um, reaching an agreement on issues that actually P should be deciding him or herself. So again, you know, if you're talking about um, should a property be sold, you know, and everyone's agreed that, that P doesn't have capacity to make that decision, should the property be sold, maybe a family member is living in the property, great. Um, family member who's living in the property says, yes, but if this property is sold, I don't get to see P as much because P is now in the nursing home, I'm not living with P anymore. Uh, so I would like it to be established by everybody that I can visit three days a week. And because I don't get on with my brother, my brother will not visit on you know Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the days that I want to be there. That latter question may well be something that P has capacity to decide for himself, even if P didn't have capacity to decide the question of who should sell the house. So I think that sort of thing in the court of protection, you just need to be really careful and, and remember that you are settling litigation concerning P and not just a, a general wider dispute between members of the family. Um, I think I've gone off a little bit of attention there. I was talking about attendance at the mediation. Um, so I've talked about mediation, uh, attendance by P. I'm also just gonna mention quickly attendance by family members. Um, my view is that it is really good for as many family members as possible to attend, to support each other. Again, we've talked about this, I talked about this in the, the wider mediation seminar that we did in October. Um, I think it's a long day. It can be really helpful to have someone to support you through that as a mediation attendee. I also think if you're dealing with financial questions, nobody makes financial decisions in a, vac in a vacuum. The vast majority of people have you know, spouses or children or you know, other people who will be affected by the outcome of a mediation. 
Um, and it can be very difficult for people to then you know, go through the whole day of mediation and then have to go home and explain it all to a spouse or a partner or whoever, um, who may not completely understand the process that the individual went through to get to that result. And so I think, you know, again, bearing in mind confidentiality, bearing in mind that that confidentiality is P's in the court of protection, the more that you can get people attending in, as a, in a supportive capacity, the better. Um, and then lastly, sorry, I decided to try and finish so that we could all have some lunch. Uh, the question of court approval. Um, obviously, if you reach a positive agreement at the end of the day, in most cases of the sort that we're talking about, you're going to need a court order approving it. Um, that, again, in and of itself is not a, a new thing. In the days when I was doing more litigation, I doing litigation work, I used to do quite a lot for the official solicitor and it was you know, day to day bread and butter uh, to have a matter that was settled through correspondence and, um, you know, you would then ask the court to list a shortish final hearing. Uh, I would put together some submissions setting out why the order was in P's best interest, working through all those criteria in section four uh, and commending the agreement to the court in much the way that uh, you would write an opinion on the merits of settlement uh, under CPR part 21. So, that in and of itself is not difficult, but I do think hopefully the fact that you have to go through that process should keep everyone's mind focused on the best interest criteria on the day itself. Um, so that is everything I wanted to say. I don't think anyone has asked a question. If they have, I can't see. Um, so thank you all for listening. Again, if you want a kind of wider mediation approach, do go back to that seminar in October.